Today's program could be compared to, well, cooking light. The generally needed layers of a jacket, the facing, the under collar, and the interfacing can be eliminated to give a non-tailored jacket silhouette. It's comparable to removing those extra calories from a recipe. How, you may ask? Well, it's a single layer jacket technique where the fabric choices and the edge finishes combine to give a carefree light appearance. Our first jacket is silk tweed. Both the right and the other right side of the fabric are visible with the outer edges finished with a serger. Single layer jacket sensations. That's what's next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman is made possible by Baby Lock, a complete line of sewing, quilting, and embroidery machines and sergers. Baby Lock, for the love of sewing. Madeira, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads, because creativity is never black and white. Koala sewing cabinets, hand-built in the USA by American craftsmen, customized for you. Clover, makers of sewing, knitting, quilting, and embroidery products for over 25 years. Experience the Clover difference. Amazing designs and Class A needles. When sewing a jacket with just one layer of fabric through all the areas of the jacket, the most important consideration is the fabric. And as we look at our finished garment, we'll see that the collar is the other right side of the fabric, just one layer, one layer for the jacket itself, and one layer for the sleeve and cuff. So to make those considerations, when choosing fabric, we have to make sure the fabric has enough substance to it, it's heavy enough. Light to medium weight fabrics probably won't work. You need medium to heavy weight fabrics and fabrics that look well on both the right side and the other right side because the lapel and collar will be the proverbial wrong side, but this time it's going to be visible for both. A heavy weight denim is also an excellent choice. And again, it's beefy enough of a fabric. This reversible quilted is hard to distinguish between one side and the other, so it's an ideal candidate. You'll see this later on in the program. Here's the jacket behind me. The fabric you can see very reversible, so perfect for this, this example. And then a wool or a boiled wool is another wonderful example. And it's a thick fabric and a great fabric to work with. The fabric I'm wearing is a tweed and it looks very comparable on both sides. Again, a nice candidate for this project. Now the pattern that I'm wearing and the pattern that's on the model has already been modified for single layer, meaning that some of the seam allowances have been trimmed and removed because the seam allowances along the outer edges, collar and jacket, hem, along the top of the cuff have all been eliminated, removed before cutting out the fabric. If we look at the tissue papers that I have on the, my table, pay special attention to the neckline area. Now this is, a, this is a pattern where the jacket has a angle to the collar there's also a version with a rounded collar, but notice that the traditional 5 eighths of an inch seam allowances have been removed from the lapel point all the way down around the jacket, and also the hemline is removed. So anything that's outer has the seam allowances removed. Since we trim starting at the lapel point of the jacket on the collar, we again trim the seam allowances away, and you can kind of see this is the lapel shape and how it will look a little bit later. The sleeve and the cuff really have very minor changes, if any. The cuff has one change, and that is to remove the seam allowance along the top edge. The sleeve doesn't have any changes because we're not having anything exposed. And in the hem, we've taken off the hem of the back piece. To make possible the finishing with the serger, I'll give you another finishing technique. But what if your pattern didn't come with the changes already made. I'll show you how to go about this. The main areas to look at are the jacket front and the collar that go together. And find that lapel point where the lapel and collar come together because you're gonna trim away the seam allowance starting at the lapel and the front area. So in this section, you'll see that the seam allowance has been removed and I'll remove down the front and also the hemline the hemline of the back would also be removed. And so that these two pattern pieces align when they're sewn together, the collar is also trimmed from that lapel dot. 
And maybe if I moved it to the right way, it would look even better. Here we go from the lapel dot where we're moving the seam allowance and then the outer edge. So anything that's on the outside. When you cut out your jacket pattern, you're going to have just the layers. The layer of the collar, the jacket front, the jacket back, the sleeve, and in this case it has a little extra cuff piece. You may or may not have that. Very few pieces making sewing very streamlined. And now I'll show you how to go about constructing the jacket. When searching this jacket, you have an option of having a light coverage on the edge or a very heavy coverage. The jacket that you just saw earlier has a very light serge or thread coverage, not very noticeable at all. But you could also take another option, another look at this, and this pattern shows, this option shows a square corner lapel pattern, and it has a very heavy coverage, almost giving a braid-like effect. It all comes down to the thread what type of weight of thread that you're going to be using when serging the edges. So when checking this out, the first thing that you need to do is to test your thread. Choose the thread, light coverage, heavy coverage, and I have on the jacket I'm wearing as well as the sample I'm going to show you a little heavier coverage. So this is a thick thread meant for a serger only. You use two spools, one spool for the upper looper, another one for the lower looper, and you use an all-purpose thread in the needle. Speaking of needles, generally when working with a serger, you have two needles. Well, to do the decorative thread on the outer edges, you're going to remove the right needle. This sample or this serger is set up with the left needle in position with all-purpose thread, and the right needle has been removed. You're going to need to test, test the length, test the settings on a scrap of fabric to see what width that you would like to do the serging. You may remember that we trimmed away the seam allowances before actually working with or cutting out the pattern. So you can serge one edge and check to see if it's balanced on both sides. Now don't use too wide of a width. That may be tempting to do this, but when doing this, and we're showing you on different samples, sometimes the very wide width is hard to handle on curves and it buckles a little bit. So use about a three to three and a half inch width or three to three and a half millimeter width. Practice a corner. If your jacket or your pattern has angled corners, surge off one edge, as I've done here, and then raise the presser foot and serge the other edge. And you can go speeding along just to do a test. And then to get the edges finished so that you do not have the thread tail, I insert from the underside a large eyed needle, bring the thread tail through this area, Courage it along, then usually I'd put a drop of a seam sealant on the underside and cut off, after it's dried, cut off the extra thread tail to have a nice sharp corner. I think I'm pretty satisfied with the look of this stitch, and now I want to check out the fabric. This fabric, when I made this jacket, raveled a little bit more than I wanted to around the edges, and you may have that too, especially if you're working with a curve. Let's just go through and show you how the jacket, the pattern, when you change it to not have an upper collar, an upper facing, not to have interfacing, you're going to be having the lapel in this instance being both the outer edge, outer fabric, and the right side of the fabric is visible. This is the way the lapel shows. And around this curve, sometimes it's very difficult to have a nice smooth curve because of the bias edges. What we like to do is to finish the edges with a little strip of interfacing, half inch bias cut interfacing. And I'm going to show you how to press that right now. What will be the underside of the lapel is where you'll add this little strip of fusible interfacing. I just have it cut a half of an inch wide and on the underside, not the top side, I'm just going to form that around the edge. So just press it around the edge to give that edge a little extra stability and security. Even if you trim some of that off during the serging process, it will be fine. It just prevents this edge from raveling. Then after pressing this in place, just around that curve, then we're going to do the serging. The serging for good on all these outer edges. Now because this is a lapel, it had a seam that will be sewn a little bit later. Remember that little notch that I had? I'm going to fold that under 
and place this underneath the presser foot, starting with the needle in the raised position, starting to surge right where the seam would end or begin, however you want to describe it. Now as I'm surging, I'm gently rounding the corner. I like to go at an even speed, not too fast. You know, with a serger, you can go over the speed limit. But in this instance, we're just going to go a little bit slower. And now I'm getting to the front of the jacket. And I'm just gonna keep going. And I would round the corner. It's getting there. Well, soon we'll get to the hem. And then I'll be surging the lower edge of the jacket. Now you're gonna see this in the next step. But here I have surged this outer edge, and this is how it will flip. I'll be, let's flip it to the correct side. We're flipping it to the outside. And now we're ready to assemble the shoulder seam. After surging all the edges that will be on the outer side of the jacket, it's time to assemble the jacket. And this is where you have to pay special attention to the sequence with which it's put together because after all, it's one layer. The undercolor is gone, the facings are gone, the interfacing throughout the whole jacket is gone. It's just this lightweight, pretty fabric you're going to deal with. This jacket serves as two sets of samples. On, on the left side, you can see that the jacket was surged, starting at the lapel point all the way around the edge, and then all the way around the hemline. And then the back was also surged along the hemline. On this sample, we chose to surge the pieces individually, then stitch the side seams. To get rid of this extra thread tail, you'd place a drop, again, of the seam sealant, let it dry, tuck it under, and do a little hand stitching to catch the seam so that on the outer jacket, it appears continuous around the hemline. The other area that it's going to be surged is the collar, starting at the lapel point and around the edges, just again, surging the areas that will be on the outer side, not sur decoratively surging the seams. Now I did surge the seams with just an overcast stitch so that it wouldn't ravel, but not with a decorative stitch. And I again did seam sealant to lock those decorative threads. Now this is where I always have to stop and think how to assemble the jacket. Because as we look at the jacket on its right side, you'll see that all the outer edges, those serge edges, come together at that lapel point. Remember when we cut the pattern, it was the seam allowances were trimmed at this point? Well, now they have to come back together at this point. Since I have half the collar sewn on, I'm going to flip to the underside, and there you'll see the seam allowances. That's where they'll be under the lapel, under the collar. And I have them pressed open, but how, how at first at this point to get it in the spot? Follow the instructions on your guide sheet, how to assemble it with this little caveat. Instead of having right sides meeting, which is the normal case for sewing seams, you're going to take what is now the outer portion of the ja of jacket collar and meet it to the inside of the jacket. So it will be the outer area with the sides meeting, the right side meeting the wrong side, so the neckline. And you're going to meet just this neckline, little different sequence than what we normally work with. And I just am going to kind of finger pin this right now since I've sewn half of this, and sew the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance. And half of it, if half of it has already been sewn. Clip the threads, and then it has one more step, and that's just the little lapel point. So now again, I'm going to meet, following the instructions, just meet that seam. Now your, your jacket collar may be constructed with a di little different sequence because of the style, but I would like you just to follow your guide sheet, but keep in mind that what's going to be the outer portion of the collar will meet the inside of the jacket. Here are the seams that I just finished sewing, the lapel and neckline, and when the collar and lapel are in the right spot, they cover the seams and your single layer is sewn. An overlock surged edge is not the only option to finish the outer edge of a single layer jacket. 
One of my other favorite edge finishes borrows the Quilt Lover's binding technique and applies the two jacket edges. Use this finishing technique with ravel prone fabrics or when you'd like an extra focal point along the outer edge. Here's a close up of the jackets that you just saw. Denim is the fabric of choice with the cotton binding around the outer edges. Notice the inside of the jacket visible from now the lapel and the collar. And here we have a lighter weight fabric where we have the edge finish as well. Beautiful silk this time as the binding along the outer edge. But rather than finishing the edge and then assembling the shoulder, the lapel seam, we're going to reverse the process for this single layer finish. On my sample with this reversible green fabric, I've sewn the collar to the jacket, sewing, sewing the lapel and sewing the neckline seam, and then the next step will be to add the binding along the outer edges. Speaking of binding, just as a review, if you haven't worked with binding in the past, you cut two and a half inch strips, bias strips, enough to go around all the outer edges, then seam together, this has been seamed, and then press in half, meeting long edges and wrong sides. So you have a bias edge. Now to start the process, at one end, square off the fabric, press under, oh, a seam allowance, a fourth of an inch, three-eighths, it doesn't matter, just press under a section, and this section is what I'm going to apply to the jacket. I have found it easiest when making this technique to start with the left lapel. So I'm going to start at the lapel point. Now this fabric is one of those ravel prone fabrics. I did a little trimming before sewing this, but you can see it's sewn at the lapel point. So now I'm going to start the folded under binding at that point. And I'll just put a pin to anchor it into place. Now if you've never put on binding before, it's really a two-step process. Sew it on one side, flip it around to the other, and then hand or machine stitch it. Well, maybe that's three steps. But regardless, I'll show you the process of how this goes. I've set my machine for a fourth of an inch seam allowance. And I'm going to sew from the right side, starting right at that lapel point. I have a universal needle, I have an all-purpose thread in my machine, and I'm going to start to sew to the corner. And as I sew with this fourth of an inch seam allowance, the closer I get to the corner, I'm going to fold the fabric at an angle, angling it to the point so I know exactly where to start, what, stop I should say, and then I'm going to crease the fabric and sew until I get to that 45 degree angle and lock the stitches. I'll back up just a little bit and cut the threads. And then I'm going to fold the fabric back on itself at that angle. Now this may not be an exact 45 degree because it's a garment, not a quilt. Then bring the fabric back on itself. Now if this were a quilt, these edges would match exactly. The fold would be right along the edge, but because this has a different angle, it's not exactly square, I'm simply going to place the quilt binding down, or this time the jacket binding down, and continue to sew along the edge. At the other corner, I'd fold it back, make a 45 degree mark, cut the threads, and then fold it back and do the same fold. And again, in the instructions that accompany the program, you'll get all of these details. Follow stitching the binding around the completed jacket till you reach the other lapel point. And at this lapel point, again, you're going to cut the fabric, turn under some edges, and continue sewing. Second step, wrap the fabric binding around the edge. Either top stitch, or I was done on this lower edge, hand stitch the binding into place. You're going to add the binding to the collar in the same manner. So whether you're working with quilt binding around the edge or serging, it's a single layer sensation.
It's now time for Nancy's Corner, and you're going to be inspired in this segment of Sewing with Nancy. We're going to learn about a novel quilt, both in the literal and figurative sense, because the quilt you're going to see was inspired by a novel and has many unique blocks in it. I'd like you to meet our guest, Jennifer Cheverini, who is a New York Times best-selling author, both novels and also quilt books. That's right. And today we're going to talk a little bit about an online quilting committee community, Jennifer, and how the book you wrote inspired quilting instructions, inspired a quilting community worldwide. Well, this story really, I think, just is kind of encapsulates the whole wonderful sharing that goes on in the quilting community all around mm -hmm. the world. I first started this quilt called Sylvia's Bridal Sampler as part of a story. So it was created in words long before it was created in <laughs> stitches. In the, one of my novels called The Master Quilter, Sylvia, the main character of all of my books, has gotten married. And as quilters do in the real world, mm -hmm. a lot of her friends got together and wanted to create a special quilt to celebrate the occasion. So while Sylvia wasn't looking, they snuck around and they told mm -hmm. all their friends and Sylvia's former students and other quilters around the world to create a special block for this sampler quilt, something that would explain or represent what Sylvia meant to them, either either as a quilt artist or as a teacher or as a friend. And they were supposed to stitch a six inch block and send that into Sylvia's friends at Elm Creek Manor. And then they hoped to create a beautiful quilt from these blocks and present them to Sylvia in at the end of the story. But of course, it would be a very dull story if it all happened smoothly. Oh, I certainly. So there are a lot of twists and turns of the plot, but at the end of the story, they have created a beautiful sampler quilt with 140 blocks for to present to Sylvia. And since it's a special bridal sampler, a lot of the blocks have weddings or mm -hmm. friendship or love as a theme. There's a true lover's knot block, of course, to represent the, the newlyweds. Mm -hmm. And then there's a bride's bouquet block as well, and many others uh, with a similar theme. And others just speak to how Sylvia was important to them as a quilt instructor. Some of them took their very first quilting lessons from Sylvia, and they wanted to use this occasion to celebrate that. And as I usually like to do, once I finish the book, I like to take, I like to create the quilt that the characters made in the story because I like to take that around on my book tours and show my readers so mm -hmm. that they can see the quilt that my characters were making. And so I knew I couldn't do this on my own because this is, a, <laughs> this is quite Daunting. a big project. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I enlisted the help of many of my quilting friends, uh, both within my quilting guild, the Mad City Quilters, in my hometown of Madison, Wisconsin, and also quilters that I know from online friendships mm -hmm. and from around the world. And so I would offer them samples from one of my fabric lines and a drawing of the block. And then all those wonderful friends pitched in and made these blocks and sent them to me so that I could put them all together and create the quilt. But that bit beautiful quilt that everyone has been seeing didn't stop there. No, no, not at all. In fact, it began to create its own new story <laughs> once the quilt was completed. <clears throat> As I would go around on my book tour and I would show people the quilt, mm -hmm. Quilters, who were also readers, were inspired and they decided that they wanted to try their hand at creating their own versions of Sylvia's Bridal Sampler. So I wanted to make this possible for them because I know how that, I know that my readers are not just readers, there's also creative people in their Certainly. own right. So when I had a pattern book come out a few years later, I included patterns for five of the blocks. But there are 140 blocks. Exactly. So when readers and quilters had a taste of those five blocks, well, they wanted the remaining 135. And mm -hmm. who can blame them? Because it's, certainly. it's a daunting project, but a fun one as well. So an online community was established. Exactly. I wanted to be able to get these blocks and patterns to my readers and mm -hmm. to all these quilters. So I started a blog. I started a website where every few days I would write up one of the quilt patterns and I'd post it. Mm -hmm. And then all of those readers who wanted those remaining blocks could just download them with a click and then make their own versions. But it didn't stop there. What I was very gratified by was that once quilters began making their own blocks, they would scan them in or take digital photos and then they would email me pictures of their blocks. 
And so I started a gallery page on the website so that quilters from around the world could take inspiration from what other quilters were making. From around the world, literally, Belgium, France. Yes, the Netherlands, Dutch quilters especially have taken mm -hmm. to this project. And as more quilters began to see and take inspiration from other quilters' work, more began to join in. And so I have now seen pictures of many beautiful quilts. There's one by Annelies Vandenberg, a Dutch quilter, and I think she was the first person other than my friends and, mm -hmm. and I to complete one of these fine samplers. They're really amazing and our viewers can go to silviosbridalsampler.org and view some of these samples and to see how a novel started a online community, started instructions. Jennifer, your writing has really gone worldwide. Well, and then that's very gratifying for me as an author to see how people have responded to not only the stories, but also the quilts that have come from the stories. Well, thank you for being on Sewing with Nancy, and I hope you too will be inspired to look at Sylvia's Bridal Sampler and create a sampler to yourself. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now. Nancy's single layer jacket pattern from McCall serves as the reference for this program. It's $9.99 plus shipping and handling. To order the pattern, call 800-336-8373 or visit our website at sewingwithnancy.com backslash 2304. Order item number M5821M for sizes 8 to 16 and item number M5821W for sizes 18W to 24W. Credit card orders only. To pay by check or money order, call for details. Visit Nancy's website at SewingWithNancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman is made possible by Baby Lock, Madeira Threads, Koala Cabinets, Clover, Amazing Designs, and Class A Needles. Closed captioning funding provided by Rowenta. Sewing with Nancy is a co-production of Nancy Zeman Productions and Wisconsin Public Television.